with a show of hands, uh, that we living in America are living in an evil time. How many of you think that we're living in an evil time? And I'm talking about an evil world per se. I'm just talking about in the United States itself, where there is uh, more people sinning in that sense than living righteously. Saw a number of hands. How many think that uh, we're living in the worst time of America's 250 year history in terms of evil and sin? Yeah, I, I, I have no way of knowing whether or how to answer that. I mean, I definitely think you could make a case because it does seem like evil is being done, sin is being done a lot. And not only that, it seems that it's being celebrated. A lot of it's being celebrated, and so I think you could make a case. And so that can be a dis- disconcerting time, especially if, if things are getting worse spiritually as a nation. So you know, like, how do we Christians live? I mean, that's, that's a scary thing to think about. I mean, there are a lot of things that are going on. I mean, there is even some of the religious liberties that we used to enjoy are slowly being uh, lost. And so there is concern, understandably so, about such times. That's true nationally, but what about personally? Do you feel personally that your faith right now is under assault? Anyone want to raise? You don't have to raise your hand, but if you want to, your faith is personally under attack. I know I've had a number of times where that's been true. Sometimes it's because of circumstances, right? Things are just going bad. They're just being difficult. You don't know why things are happening. And then other times, it's an individual who's going after you, whether it's personally or after your faith. Those times are scary. There have been a handful of times in my life where that was the case. And in such times where you're just under assault, under attack, whether it's nationally or personally, it can be a fearful time, right? What's going to happen? What's going to happen at the election, no matter who wins? How are people going to respond? Is this nation going to split apart? It's going to divide. How's it going to affect our economy? How's it going to affect our security? All those things. And then if someone else is individually attacking you, like, is my job at risk? What about my house? All kinds of things can happen when we are under assault. Today we're at the halfway point in our study of Elijah. Uh, God's man for a godless time, and one of the things we need to ask whenever we are feeling fearful, whenever we are feeling attacked, whether it's as a church in America or an individual, we need to also ask one other question, and that is, what does God ask of us? How does God expect us to live? What are the guidelines? What is the direction? How does He expect us to live when we're living in a godless time. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to work through Elijah, because I think Elijah gives us a lot of good, helpful, practical examples to whether we're living in a, an age or at a time where our nation is going in the wrong direction, or personally, we're being attacked. How do we respond? So if you have your Bibles, please open them to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be covering this famous account from the probably one of the most famous accounts from the life of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. And there are two truths. There are two truths that uh, we see in 1 Kings chapter 18. The first truth defines what a godless or evil time is. It defines it. The second truth shows us how God defeats it. First truth defines what an evil or godless time is. The second truth shows how God goes about defeating such evil times that we can live in and experience. First, the definition. In evil times, God's servants are few, fearful, and faithful. In godless times, God's servants are few, fearful, and faithful. The definition of an evil time is where the people who are living for God, the people who are living like Christ wants them to live, there's not many of them. And they have a reason to be not just concerned about what's going on, but fearful. They have a legitimate 
God recognizes they have a legitimate reason to be afraid of the events and how it could impact their lives. And yet, they are also faithful. They are still obedient. They are still following after God. Now, one of the things that I had first started to kind of put this definition in is, is in evil times, God's people are few, fearful, and faithful. And I realized I couldn't quite do that because we're only focusing on, in that sense, God's people in the Old Testament, the Israelites. They were supposed to be living for God, but unfortunately, most of the people who should have been living for God chose not to. And so while they are, quote, God's people, they are, quote, church folk, they aren't living as such. And in this passage, the highlight, the emphasis is not so much on God's people, Israel, but on God's servants, the people of ethnic Jews who were living as God wanted them to do. And so that's why I said in evil times, God's servants, people whose primary attention is how can I serve, how can I obey God in this time? So in evil times, God's servants are few, fearful, and faithful. This... uh, Chapter 18 is really based on what Ben covered, and he said he had a lot of ground to cover. I've got a lot of ground to cover today as well, but it's based on chapter 17. I'm not going to rehearse the whole sermon, but just in case he didn't cover verse 1, let me cover verse 1 because of chapter 17. Oh, let me go do the timeline first, uh, now that I think about it. Um, let me set up the last 70 years. We've covered 70 years over the last five sermons. And they're going to go quickly through this, but after the death of Solomon, his uh, Jeroboam ended up becoming king of the northern ten tribes, and then it's uh, Nadab, and by the way, these are all in kind of an orangish-yellow because they're all bad. There's only green is the only uh, people that are put in, in uh, the kings that are, that are good, uh, and you'll see Basha was bad, Elah was bad, Zimri was bad. Omri is bad, Tibni is bad, all the northern kings, bad, 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 bad. South, not much better. Rehoboam, Solomon's son in Judah, bad. Abijam, bad. Finally, we have someone that's good. Asa, King Asa had a longer reign. And uh, kind of going next to the next slide. He had a good long reign, uh, but his son, uh, Jehoshaphat, He's also good, and uh, we don't have covered him yet, um, but he's actually around during the time of Elijah. But uh, back up in the north, the son of Omri, King Abraham, is bad, as I hope you introduced the fact that Ahab was bad, right? Everyone pretty much from Sunday school knows that King Ahab was a bad king. And so this is where we're at, Um, and we're actually at the end of King Ahab's reign, we think, based on research that Elijah came near the end of the last seven years or so of King Ahab's reign, and he continued on for some time doing ministry after King Ahab. And where we're looking at today, both chapter 17-1, but then most of 18, is the first part of Elijah's ministry when, like we are in a drought, Israel, the northern tribes of Israel are also in a drought. So, Looking at uh, ver- verse 17. Oh, did I not work? There it is. Oh, there I skipped it. Where'd it go? There it is. 17.1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe, that's why he's called the Tishbite. He's from Tishbe. Uh, in Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. When he says, before whom I stand, what he's saying? I am his servant. I am standing in attention. I am paying attention to whatever God wants me to do. As he lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So what you have is this out of the blue, Elijah shows up, tells evil King Ahab, because of the sin, because of the idolatry that you have done, God says, no more rain until I tell you, God says, now rain is coming. That's where we end. That's where we start, essentially, chapter 18, is based on that. We're waiting for rain to come. And so in chapter 18, after many days, the word of the Lord finally came to eat Elijah. In the third year, have you ever been in a situation 
in your spiritual life where you want to hear from God and you don't? You know, there's a physical drought, but there's also a spiritual drought that's being addressed here. Elijah went before Ahab three years ago by now, and he said, the last time that God ever said something, no rain until I tell you again. Do you wonder if every day when he woke up, had his devotions, okay, God's going to say, rain's coming. One of the things I think is interesting about this passage is it reminds us that while the lack of physical rain is key, what we really ultimately need is God's rain, His spiritual provision, His speaking and His guiding. And what I find also very important in this passage is basically the last thing you know God told you to do, keep doing it until He tells you otherwise. That's one of the key issues that I've learned in my own life is, God, I want you to lead me in this particular way. Why aren't you saying anything? I did way back here. Keep doing that. After many days, the word of the Lord finally came in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Why would he say go show yourself to Ahab? Well, basically, Elijah is living in exile, right? If you go to an evil king and say, because of your wicked ways, because of the sin that you're doing, God says no more rain until I tell you again, and it's been three years, do you think you're on the most favored status of King Ahab? No. And so as a result, in following God's lead, Elijah is actually living outside of the land of Israel. He's living way up here in Zarephath. Way up here in Zarephath is where he is. Samaria is the capital. Jezreel is kind of the winter capital. This is the main capital. This is in the mountains. So you go there in the summertime when it's nice and cool. And then when the winter comes, you kind of move down into the valley, into Jezreel, which is where King Ahab likely is at this point. But he's up here. So God says, Elijah, I want you to go show yourself to Ahab. So Elijah finally makes a journey along the coast. Is going to be coming down probably into this area. And here was where what's going on. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in the land of Samaria. Last couple of months, we've had maybe two inches of rain total. And the the grounds are really dry, right? Super dry. I was talking to Oliver before the service, and he was saying, it's so dry, I can stick my hand through cracks in the ground where our fields are. Right? That's just after two months, two to three months of only a couple of inches of rain. Can you imagine how bad the drought is in the land of Israel when they have not had any rain For three years, in fact, the New Testament makes clear it's actually three and a half years. I mean, it is super, super dry. And Ahab, he's he's a bad, he's an evil king. He's not the kind of king that worships God, but he still cares about his rule. He still cares about his domain. And so as a result, he calls Obadiah to come help him. Obadiah was over his household. You could kind of view him as kind of like chief of staff in the presidency, right? He's over the household. He manages the the president or the king's life. What's interesting about Obadiah is he didn't just have a primo position, but unlike his boss, he feared the Lord greatly. Have you ever worked in a situation, have you ever been in a working environment where you want to honor Jesus and the person over you hates Jesus? It's not an easy position to be in, right? They're not willing to follow what God wants. And they often put pressure on you to not do that. But that's not Obadiah. Obadiah says, I am following God, but it's often quietly. It's in the privacy of his own home. Look at verse 5. So Ahab says to Obadiah, given this severe drought that's going on in the land, I want you to go through the land to all the springs and water areas and all the valleys. Perhaps we can find some grass to save the horses and mules to let them live and not lose some of the animals. Ahab is a bad king, but he still cares about animals, especially his animals. And because of the three-year drought, the places for pasture have really literally shriveled up. 
And so there are various springs, waterways, rivers, all those kinds of... Find some kind of grass. That's what Obadiah is doing. God said to Elijah, I want you to go back and show yourself to Ahab. Ahab, at the same time, because of the severe drought, has his Obadiah. Go find pastures. You probably see what's coming, right? So between... Ahab and Obadiah, they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction. Most likely he went south. Obadiah went in the other direction, most likely north by himself. And as Obadiah is on the road, on the way, behold, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? Now why would Obadiah recognize Elijah? A lot of the commentators say that you know prophets would often wear kind of strange clothes that would kind of give it away. But if, as we've seen before, if Elijah appeared once before to King Ahab and says, it's going to be a drought until I tell you it stops. That one encounter, especially as years pass, kind of embeds Elijah's face and name, I'm sure, into the the realm and the discussion of King Ahab. And if Obadiah was the chief of staff, he most likely interacted with Elijah when Elijah first came to the king. And so he says, I think it's you, but it's been a long time. Three years ago. Last time I met, first time I met you was three years ago. It's the last time I saw you. Is that you, my Lord Elijah? And Elijah answered said, yes, it is I. So go tell your Lord, King Ahab, behold, Elijah is here. Here's where I think it's really, really interesting and funny in some ways. Obadiah responds, how have I sinned? What wrong have I done that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? How in the world, you know, you're despised. And now you want me to go tell Ahab that, oh, by the way, I was walking along looking for some grass, and guess who I came across? The guy who's responsible for us not having any green grass. He fears for his life. Because there's this recognition. I recognize Ahab. Maybe I'm going to be protecting Ahab. Maybe I'm connected with Ahab. Are you trying to kill me? As the Lord God lives, there is no nation in the kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you. Ahab has been hunting for your life these last three years. In fact, when he would go to all these different nations and they would say he is not there, he would make them take an oath of the kingdom that they had not found you, that they were even looking for you. He made sure you are a wanted man. Here's where... I think we are somewhere in this valley area. And he's, what he's saying is, we recognize you fled because Ahab hated and despised you. And he's, he sent to names, all these, he sent your name, hey, all these neighboring nations. Hey, is Elijah living in your territory? They would say, no. Do you swear that he is not in your territory? They would say, yes, we swear he is not in our territory. They've been looking for him for three years. He's basically the most wanted man in all of Israel. A million dollars or something like that on his head. Elijah is under attack as well. And now you tell me, Obadiah says, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here? You want me to admit to this? For as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away to know not where. We don't know where the Lord led you before in the last three years. I mean, your way of hiding. I mean, we could not find you. And now I'm going to go back and tell the guy who hates your guts and has the power to lop off my head that, oh, by the way, I happened to run across Elijah on the road in this location. I tell him that. Come back. The Spirit takes you somewhere else. I'm a dead, I'm a dead guy. So when he cannot find you, he will kill me instead, because I know the kind of guy I work for. This is how despicable, how evil King Ahab was. 
Even if he thought you were in collaboration with Elijah, you're dead meat. God's people have a reason to be afraid in evil times. They're not in power, and there's not many of them. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. I remembered the Sunday school, well, Sabbath day stories. And I trusted and have been trusting in God since a kid, even to this day. In fact, has it not even been told to you what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? When Ahab's wife, who I also work for, I heard that they were going to kill all these prophets. I mean, they were going to eliminate God's prophets entirely. And so what I did, I secretly, I hid a hundred of those prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water out of my own pocket. Have you not heard that? Now, why would he say, have you not heard that? Well, first of all, it probably happened sometimes in these last three years, right? And why would you think Jezebel and Ahab would be rounding up the Lord's prophets if Elijah says, God has said, there will be no more rain? He's trying to get God to talk. Send rain. They said, we can't. He has not revealed it. Off with your head. Off with your head. Off with your head. He's killing them all, and Obadiah secretly undermines their plans and protects a hundred of the Lord's prophets by hiding them in caves. Here are four of the caves in that region. Four different caves. I, in my research this past week, there are over 2,000 of these just in that area alone. So plenty of places for Obadiah to show, hey, I am supportive of God. I want to follow God. I'm going to protect those people who bring God's word to his people. But Elijah then responds, As the Lord of hosts lives, the Lord of armies lives, the Lord who is the most powerful that there is, as long as he lives, before whom I stand, before whom I I promise you I will surely show myself to him today. One of the things that I find interesting about this passage is that Elijah does not condemn Obadiah for being afraid for his life. He knows the kind of evil guy he's working for. Shoot, he's been on the run essentially for three years and in hiding. He doesn't fault Obadiah for his fear. Rather, he says, trust me, God has sent me to go see Ahab today. When you go tell Ahab that here's where I am, I will be here. Why? Because just as Obadiah has been faithful, so too Elijah has been faithful. He has not gone and seen Ahab because God has not told him for three years, even though I suspect he wanted to go home. Now, after 10 to 12 days, seeing this beautiful land, we're ready to come home. We're ready to be with you, our friends, our family. Don't you think that would have been true of Elijah? But he was willing to be exiled for three years because God said, stay in exile until I tell you to go show yourself to Ahab. And that's what Elijah did. He was faithful. And so he tells Obadiah, no, I'm going to be here. And so Obadiah is faithful as well. And he goes and he tells Ahab. Ahab comes and comes to where Elijah is. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is that you, the troubler of Israel? The one who's caused us all these problems. The word troubler here is very interesting. It's only used 14 times in the Old Testament. Two of those times were of two different people, other than, in this case, Ahab accusing Elijah of being a troubler. Basically what Ahab is saying is, Elijah, you are like Achan, or you are like a bad form of King Saul. 
You are the problem. You have brought death to this people. Sometimes, when you're living in an evil world, when you do what is right and good, it is called evil. That's what Ahab does. Says Elijah, you're the problem. But Elijah, he's got some boldness, right? He's a prophet. He looks right back at King Ahab and says, I have not troubled Israel. You have. You're the one who's brought the problems. Why? Because you and your father's house have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and had followed various and followed the Baals. Now, commentators, why does he use plural form Baals? Well, that's because there were many different idol carvings of him. There were a lot of different stories sometimes competing. And so he's basically saying, I don't care which version it is, but basically you're following after idolatry. Here's one of the idols that we have found of Baal that uh, come from that time. He doesn't look very powerful and imposing, but he was in the ancient world in Israel's time. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. I, I think it, the reason why they were in this area is they could have easily seen Mar Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat Je at Jezebel's table. Basically, what you have is the king and his wife are supporting idolatry by feeding all these false prophets. In fact, there are 850. We know there are at least 852 people who were worshiping some deity other than Yahweh. And based on just this passage, we know of only 102 who are still living, who worshiped God, right? The 100 prophets that Obadiah saved, plus Obadiah and Elijah. Verses 852. Ahab, Jezebel, and the 850 prophets of these two deities. The wicked are many. The righteous are few. The wicked are in power. They can wreak havoc on your life. They've even killed those who have followed God. Those who are left, who have been faithful to God, are few and understandably fearful. That's what an evil time is. But the hope comes in the second truth. That's how you define what an evil time looks like. How's an evil time defeated? You know, I probably have some pictures of Mount Carmel from the south and from the north, kind of a mountain ridge. Here's the second point. When defeating evil, God allows the worst to expose its weakness to his powerful response to prayer. When defeating evil, God allows the worst. Here's one of the things you need to learn about God. Something that has taken me years to figure out, just by growing up in the church. Is when it gets bad... God likes to let it get worse. Have you ever experienced that? Huh? Yeah, you know, that bad, and then all of a sudden, more bad happens. Things get worse. Why is that? Because God wants to show that even the worst demonstrations of evil in this world are nothing compared to His power in response to His people's prayer. I mean, we see this time and time and time again throughout the Scriptures. Why did God wait over 100 to 120 years of Israel suffering into slavery? Just to show that in an instant, whenever He wants, in an answer to prayer, He can free them like that. The opposition to Christ grows and grows and grows, all to the point where it went. the worst happens. They kill Him. Why? To show that he can raise him from the dead. When defeating evil, God allows the worst to expose evil's weakness 
to his powerful response to prayer. You see, when people are being faithful in evil times, what are they doing? They're trusting God with everything. They're praying, God, save us. And God has heard that prayer, but the way in which he answers it isn't always the way in which we would like him to. Sometimes he allows the heat from evil to be turned up even more. That's the truth that we see yet again in this passage at the second half of 1 Kings 18. Elijah comes near all the people. All these people from Israel have gathered. Most likely not everyone, but the, at least the key representatives. So you're probably looking at hundreds if not thousands of people. Elijah comes near to all the people and he says, okay, we're going to have a wager on top of Mount Carmel. Here's the wager. But first of all, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, though, follow him. The people didn't say a thing. This is almost verbatim, not quite verbatim, because he wasn't talking about Baal, but Joshua says, choose you this day. Whom are you going to follow? If it's God, fine. If it's someone else, fine. But choose. Then the people said, we will follow the Lord. Here, crickets. (laughs) You know what I mean? Nothing. How long will you go be limping? You see, there's been a slow, steady decay in the following of God. You remember it started with Jeroboam? We're going to worship God, but we're going to worship in the way I want to worship because I'm going to protect my power. And so we set up basically an alternative to the worship of God in Jerusalem. Had all the religious festivals and all those kinds of things, but it's on his terms, not on God's terms. But one of the things that he started to do is, you know, not just worship God in our own terms, but you know what? We're going to kind of connect God with Asherah. We saw that again. It's a fertility goddess. Those two are going to be your, your gods because God's got to be married to someone, right? That was but Baal was more associated with Asherah than, than Yahweh. I mean, he actually says it's just him. We want more gods, not fewer. Basically, that's what Ahab has done. You know, people one kind of going to the Lord, but you know, now we're kind of limping back towards Baal. Choose who you're going to say. People don't say a thing. Elijah says to the people, I, even I only, am the, I'm the only prophet left of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. We're going to see this next week. But Elijah overstates this case, right? He's right. There's not many of us around. But he gets it slightly wrong because Obadiah clearly told him there's at least a hundred of you prophets and I'm also serving the Lord too. But I guess Elijah's like most of us preachers. We like to kind of embellish the story for effect. (laughs) Right? I'm the only one left. And there are 450 prophets of Baal. One against 450. See how bad it's getting? Let two bulls be given to us. They can choose which is the better bull. Right? Let them cut into pieces, lay it on the wood, but don't put any fire. I will prepare the other bull. I'll take the lower quality one. The second rate one. God's really stacking the deck here. We've learned, we'll learn here in a, in a second, that God had given him all these plans, most likely when he said, go present yourself before Ahab. Most likely choosing Mount Carmel. And then all these other pieces. God's saying, I'll take a second-rate sacrifice. I'll let the other team pick first. I mean, yesterday was a great day of college football. Some of my teams won, some of them didn't. But the games are close, right? God is... For Not all of them, but some of the games were close. <laughs> some of the games were close. Tight, tight games. God says, I don't want that. I want to be down 
zero to 100 with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. That's how God operates. Don't put any wood, put the wood on it, put the bull on it, but don't light it. Instead, the 450 prophets of Baal, a lot of people praying to Baal. You call him the name of your God, he doesn't even want to name him as a God. And I will call upon the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. That is the one who is God. The one who destroys, you know, the answer by fire is likely thunderbolt, like lightning kind of a thing. And all the people says, brilliant. It is well spoken. This is a great test. Oh yeah, by the way, Baal, he's the God of the storm and rain. I don't know about you, but if you're going to have heart surgery, would you go to a wonderful doctor, Michael Atherley, and ask him to do your heart surgery? No? You don't want Michael Atherley to... Huh? Absolutely. What? If <laughs> Only if absolutely necessary, right? Why, why do we say that? I mean, Mike Atherley attends this church. I love him dearly. I wish he was here. I'm sure we would have had a little bit of fun with this. Why do we say that? You go to a specialist, right? You want someone who does it all the time. That's what we've got going on here. God, Yahweh, the Lord... He says he is it. But he's in competition with all kinds of deities in Israel's day. And in particular, we're dealing with the deity of Baal. And Baal is the god of the storm. He is the specialist. He's not the generalist, does it all kind of thing. I mean, there's a place for those in doctors. kind of. But that's the situation that's going on here. Here's a picture. I don't know if you can see it very well. Here's another rendition of, of a bale. You, you got the bale here. He's got a kind of a club showing how powerful he is, the power of the storm. Now, I don't know if you can see it right here, but it has this, this is lightning. He's holding lightning. Why do the people say this is a brilliant idea? Bale is in charge of the storms. And they're on top of where? Mount Carmel. Where do you want to not be in the middle of a storm? <laughs> On the mountaintop, right? Here's the traditional location, probably the highest peak. A couple of zooming in. Um, they have a monastery and stuff like this. This is kind of the, probably the key area as to where they were gathered, all the people. Um, I'll go back here for a second. Elijah will come back here to look out. You can also see how high up, up above the valley it is, so you got a great viewpoint here. This is a zoomed-in area, a large kind of flat area still in the mountain. Um, and then this is, let's see here, if I get it, what happened? Ooh. Is it, uh, can you advance it once? Hit the space bar. I'm locked, is it, is it locked up? Oh, there we go. And then here you can see another, This uh, looking north, I think over here is the Mediterranean kind of sea. So, you know, an amazing vantage point, right? That's where this is all happening. They've agreed to the plan. Now pay attention to the differences between how the prophets of Baal versus Elijah respond. So they take the bull that was given them, prepared it, called it, and then started calling on the name of Baal in the morning. One of the things I noticed in comparing the two is they aren't building an altar. They didn't have to. They already had an altar here. This is their home turf, right? Well, technically not. I mean, God owns it all. But in their understanding, this is their home turf. Their altar is already in place. All they have to do is cut up the animal, kill the animal and cut it up. That's what they do. They put it on. And in the morning, probably 8, 9 in the morning, they start praying, Baal, answer us. They do that from morning to noon. Nothing. No voice. No one answered. And so they start limping around. This is really God kind of joking. They're really dancing. They're kind of going really crazy. You know, it's kind of a mosh pit up on Mount Carmel, right? That's what's going on here, folks. They're trying to get his attention. They're, they're jumping up and down. 
Hey, hey, Dale, we're here. Send down fire. I know this because as a kid, we did a play on this, a musical. And I was one of the prophets of Baal. I still remember the song, Baal, Baal, we worship you. Send down fire on this year altar. Baal, Baal, we're doing this. <laughs> you know, that's what you want to do when you're like get a bunch of 10-year-olds, right? Get that energy out. Right? We're doing it. Bail, bail. Oh, by the way, I got saved and baptized right afterwards. And that's not quite saved, but I did get baptized right after that. But of course, I did get killed in between. But that's another story. <laughs> that's coming up. Bail, answer us. There is no voice. They limped around the altar they had made. Nothing. At noon, Elijah starts mocking them. He's been listening to them now for three to four hours. Parents, you, you understand this, right? A young child likes a particular song. How often do they want to listen to it? Over and over and over, right? Now imagine 450 men <laughs> for three or four hours. It sounds like a football game, but that's another story too. Saying the same thing, Baal, Baal, we worship you, send on fire this year altar. He's like, I have got to say something or I'm going to go nuts. So he mocks them, cry loud. You're not loud enough, for he is a God. He's either amusing or relieving himself. He's trying to come up with some kind of a good idea, or he is relieving himself. Now, those of you who, like my last sermon a couple of weeks ago about peeing on a wall, would think I would really pick up on this. We're not really sure if he's saying he's taking, actually they think it could be either taking a dump or stepping aside or kind of doing a sidestep. We're not sure which one it is. Whatever the case is, Elijah is mocking him, but he is mocking him in such a way that what he is saying is actually true. And what I mean by that is, is that the prophets of Baal understood and would accept the fact that Baal would have to take a dump, for example. Or he would have to think about a special plan. Or that he would go on a journey. Or that he even would get tired. You see what God is trying to do here. One of the things that God does when he wants to show evil people the foolishness of their ways is he lets them to the nth degree demonstrate just how foolish it is. I mean, you want to serve a God who has to take a potty break? Really? Really? What if it's in the middle of a storm? That's crazy. That's what Elijah says. The God who made the heavens and the earth, just by speaking it out, he doesn't need that. And you want to serve him? Even if he is a deity, why would you? And so they cried even louder, and then they start to cut themselves, as was their custom, with swords and lances, until the blood is gushing from them. They're trying to make as big of a spectacle so that in their understanding, Baal, who is somehow distracted, would, hey, what's going on down there? Maybe I should go check it out and send a lightning bolt. That's how they're thinking. But of course, Elijah knows they're just making fool of themselves in front of a bunch of people on a mountaintop. As midday passed and they raved, they raved until the time of the offering of the oblation. That's 3 p.m. So now they have been raving for six, seven, eight, maybe eight hours. No voice. No answer. In fact, I think this is a double entendre. No one paid attention. After seven or eight hours, even the Israelites who have gathered to see whose God is going to be the one who sends down fire are bored. Then Elijah says to the people, come near to me. Get close. You need to hear this. So all the people came near to him. What does he do? He repairs the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Remember how I said God lets it get worse? Apparently, sometime in the past, 
people who did want to honor and worship God had built an altar, but Jezebel and Ahab destroyed it. This is their turf. But he rebuilds it. He rebuilds the altar. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, on whom the word of the Lord said, Israel shall be your name. How many tribes were in the northern kingdoms? Ten. How many stones does Elijah gather? What is Elijah saying? He doesn't, God doesn't care about the political divisions. He cares about the spiritual unity of his people worshiping him. God hasn't forgotten Judah either, or Benjamin. He's still their God. We may not be getting along with them right now, but he is still their God. There's also some wisdom in that in terms of church unity, too. Israel shall be your name. What does Israel mean? One who struggles with God. God is basically saying, I'm tired of fighting you to be your God. I should not have to do that. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, about as great as would contain two selahs of seed. Two selahs of seed would be the equivalent to about two and a half gallons. That doesn't seem like a lot to most commentators, and I agree. I think what, what most think they mean is basically he dug a trench about two and a half gallons deep, if you think of milk gallons or something like that, and dug it all the way around. Not that just there was just two and a half gallons of water in a trench, because these are some of the sizes of the altars that he would have built. See how that's a pretty good size. And here's another one where you can actually see a trench for drainage. So he built something like that, repaired it, and then built it something like that. Remember, God likes to get to worse, right? Why is he digging a trench? This is the only one that I know of in the scriptures in worship of God where a trench was built. Well, we'll see in a second. Put the wood in order, cut the bull into pieces. So he had to do all this preliminary work because it was left go. It was destroyed. Finally gets to killing the bull, putting the wood. And now he says, fill four jars of water. These were probably larger jars. And pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. Why would you want to wet something you intend to burn? Has anyone done that when they try to start a fire? No, take a couple of gallons of jug, just dump it on there, man. Four gallons, of, four gallons, please. Psh. Remember what I said? God likes to make it worse so he can show how powerful his answer to prayer is. Oh, and by the way, one time's not enough. Second time, they did a second time. Third time. Why do you think three times? How long has the drought lasted? Three years. I think that's one remember. Who is the one who provides water? God is saying, I do. And more than water, you want to thirst after my word. You want to be obedient to my word. There's another reason why I think three times has happened. How many jars were used? Four times three is twelve. Do you think God is trying to get Israel's attention, not just Israel's, but Judah's attention? I am in control of the drought. I am in control of providing you nourishing rain. I am your all. The water ran around the altar so much so that it filled the trench with water as well. That was just all the preliminary work to the point of prayer. Remember the difference. All the prophets of Baal, all they had to do was kill the animal and put it on. All the work that, but then all their work came when they started praying for another eight hours. Not Elijah. By the way, it's not common that you typically have water on top of a mountain. But interestingly enough, on Mount Carmel, there are both wells and springs where they easily could have gotten water. Another wonderful way to show how historically accurate God's word is. 
At the time of the offering of the oblation, this is now three o'clock, Elijah the prophet comes near to God. Remember, he, same word here, Hebrew word. Come near to me. Now he comes near to God. What it, the picture is, he's trying to bring all of Israel closer to God. Look at his prayer. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and normally it says Jacob, but he keeps it Israel. He's trying to remind them, don't be fighting with God. Let it be known this day that you alone are God in Israel. This is where I find it interesting. He misses to add alone here. Before he said, I am alone, the prophets. This is going to get him into problems next chapter, next week. Let it be known that this day you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. When people are faithful to the Lord and they are attacked as being troublers, they want vindication. There have been a few times in my ministry where people have attacked me as doing it for myself. And boy, I want to respond. But one of the things that I have been learning in my life is it's better off to let God do the responding for you. God, you vindicate me. That's what a faithful servant does. Your issue is really not with me. It's with him. And I'm going to let him take care of it. But it's fair to pray, God, show them that I am your servant. Help them see that I've been obedient to you. God, first of all, make yourself great. Show that I'm your servant. And then look at what he adds at the end. And that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you have turned their hearts back to you. The person who saves people is not us. It's God working in our hearts and our lives. That's what Elijah prays. Apparently, it probably takes what, two minutes, maybe, maybe a minute. Bam! The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. And the Hebrews ate it. The idea is eating it. Now remember, there has been no rain. And we know later on, there are no clouds in the sky. Right? I looked up this past week. Have you ever heard of uh, like a bolt out of the blue? Have you ever heard that phrase, bolt out of the blue? Did you realize that's an actual weather-related term? There are documented cases where on occasion, in a totally blue sky, a lightning strike happens. That's what happens here. In fact, it said that, I can't remember, it's like, it can be as hot as like a million degrees, or 80,000 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. I mean, that's insane. It ate the burnt offering, it ate the wood, it ate the stone, it ate the dust, and it licked up all the water that was in the trench. God apparently was quite hungry and thirsty that day. And when all the people saw that, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They have turned and followed God. So Elijah says, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. This is a fulfillment or an obedience to God's word. Again, faithful people obey God's word. Whenever you have a false prophet, the people are supposed to kill the false prophet. And in this case, it's 450 of them, so that they do not lead them astray again. What's interesting here is it says the brook of Kishon. Normally, it's the river of Kishon, but after three years of drought, it's likely that it's pretty dry and there's only puddles. So they go down. Here's a kind of a picture of where we're at. So this is some of the spots there on Mount Carmel that I was talking about. Here you see the Kishon River, or now it's just a brook. And then here's Jezreel, the, the capital. This is about 17 miles here. So they take them down this, all, this range. Here you can see from the top of Mount Carmel, here's the Kishon River. Um, here's a couple other pictures. You can see it was a rather sizable river, uh, up and up, but after three years of drought, probably not so sizable at all. 
Ahab then goes up and eats and drinks as Elijah told him to. Why? Because Elijah knows that rain is coming. Elijah and Ahab rode a chariot. And if, if rain is coming and he's going down a, sl a slope and he's going to Jezreel, his winter capital 17 miles away, he doesn't want Ahab to have low blood sugar and pass out and fall in the middle of a rainstorm. It's going to be tough enough. So Ahab eats and drinks as Elijah told him to. Elijah himself goes up to the top of Mount Carmel. He was down at the Kishon. He goes to the very top again. And he bows himself down in prayer again on the earth, puts his face between the knees, and apparently prays that God would send the rain as God had promised. He tells the servant, go now, look towards the sea. And when they looked, they said, there's nothing. And he said, go seven times. Why does God require seven times here and only one time for calling down lightning? Here's what I think God is trying to say. I can answer one prayer. I can answer seven prayers. It's not Elijah. It's me. When I answer prayer, whether after the first time or the 7,000th time, it's not who's praying per se. It's the fact that you are trusting your life with me. And I will provide. I will answer your prayers. On the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. Ahab said, or Elijah said to Ahab, Go up. Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. Again, here's where they're, they are. They're up here. They're going to go 17 miles away. Here you can see again from the top of Mount Carmel. Here's the Kishon River. And see how far away 17 miles is? You can see Jezreel. It's just way in the distance. Here's Jezreel itself. It's the capital that Ahab actually built. And we have done some study. What's interesting, too, and I don't know if this is related to the, the trench, but there was a moat around Jezreel. Um, and then you have some towers and gates uh, areas as well. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah. He gathered up his garment, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. When I read this as a kid, I thought that, you know what, God gave Elijah the ability to just run for faster than a chariot. Having studied this, I don't think it's so much faster, but the fact that after a full day, God enables Elijah to run with endurance 17 miles. I mean, that's not just something you wake up today, hey, I'm going to run 17 miles, right? If you just decided to do that, I don't care what kind of physical shape, you're not doing it, right? It takes time to build. No, that's what God did. And it's not so much that he ran faster, but that he ran ahead of the chariot, Again, from my study, here's a carving of a king and a chariot. This is not Ahab. This is, I think, a, an Assyrian king. But, you know, they have a covering, but they have people running in front. One of the reasons for doing so is it, it shows honor and respect. A, Elijah thinks Ahab has now turned to the Lord, and so he is going to be leading Ahab back to Jezreel because he thinks Ahab has repented, and God enables him to run 17 miles on an instant. All because Elijah was willing to pray and obey. So how do we apply this to our lives? Be faithful and prayerful in fearful times. Be prayerful, faithful and prayerful in fearful times. Two ways to apply this. First, growing in terms of our own understanding and then investing in how we respond to others. One of the things that I've learned about living in a fearful world where you are oppressed, where, where America seems to go downhill, is that we become afraid of the worst. And yet, this passage shows us that sometimes God allows the worst just to show how powerful He is. 
And what we as Christians need to do is when we see the worst, when we see and are afraid of the worst, God says, I get it, I understand it, but remain faithful to me. Turn to me. Pray. I will answer, whether after the first prayer or the seventh prayer, whether it's three years or one day, I will answer your prayer. The reason why I think that is so key is because when we're afraid, when we're being attacked by evil people, it's very easy for us to return as we have been dished. That's not how God's people are faithful. They trust God to vindicate them. And so they say, I will listen to your word. I will do what you tell me to do. And I will do it until you tell me to do something different. When you're under attack, when you're fearful for about our country, don't try to get more votes. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. What I'm saying, don't worry about getting votes. Be in prayer. God will vindicate his people. But often he'll let the worst come so that he can show everyone publicly His power. It's one way to apply it. The other way to apply it is just obey and pray. And speaking of prayer, this passage teaches us God is not more likely to answer prayer just because you get 10 or 100 or 150 of your best friends to be praying for you. I'm not saying don't get 150 of your best friends to be praying for you. Do that. But it's not because we have a lot of us praying that God answers our prayers. Only Elijah prayed and God answered his prayer. The point is, we are depending upon him. And if others can draw near to us and so depend on us, depend on him with us, that's what God wants. So that when he answers his prayer, it's not just me celebrating, but it's us celebrating. I have seen it in churches, kind of the two extremes. Some people think, oh, i got to get everyone praying for everything in my life. No, you don't. And then I've had other people say, I don't want to tell anyone. And then God answered a prayer and they go, hey, guess what happened? Good. That's great. I thought I was your friend. I thought I was your brother in Christ. I wish I could have prayed alongside you in that situation. On the invest side, care for those who are being attacked. Be an Obadiah. One of the things that I've seen in churches is that a good, healthy church often becomes a place of refuge for those who are attacked wrongly in another church. Because, oh yeah, remember, sometimes God's people aren't God's servants. And so if you are interacting with someone, especially if they're new, and you start finding out, you know, they were really beat up in the last church. Be an Obadiah. Hey, I would love to take you out for dinner. I'd love to hear how the church failed you. Because I have encountered so many times Christians who have cared for me, and I would love to extend that to you. Be an Obadiah. Be faithful. The last way to apply this is as you draw near to God, invite others to join you. Maybe it's a person who grew up in church and has walked away. Hey, God's really been speaking to me in this Sunday school class or in this Bible study or in the sermon series or the songs, you know. We had a, how old are you, Evie? How old are you? You're thir- she's 13, you're 13? You're 12. 11. 11. It keeps getting lower. We had 11.
I would love for you to experience an 11-year-old and a 35-year-old and a 50-year-old sing with the love of Christ in their hearts. Invite people to draw near to you as you draw near to God. Be faithful and prayerful because we are living in fearful times. Heavenly Father,